Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Lorraine Galsorp, Deputy Director of the Institute of Criminology and a member of the steering group for the Bill McWilliams Memorial uh, Lecture. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone uh, this afternoon to this 20th lecture in the series. And I think we're particularly grateful to you for braving the traffic torrential downpours and thunder and lightning to get here. We know that some of you have had particularly harried uh, journeys. Now, Bill McWilliams, who died in 1997 and who worked at the Institute uh, as a senior researcher for a good number of uh, years in the second part of his career, had a very prestigious career as a probation practitioner, as a researcher, and as a writer, and many of you here will know his quartet of articles on the probation services development up to the point at which punishment in the community debate uh, began. That seems a long time ago now. He was a staunch advocate um, of the need for rigorous evaluation of probation practice and an equally staunch critic of the excesses of management, the management ideal, as it was described at that time. And his pleas for theoretical and moral underpinnings for probation practice, I think, remain as important today uh, as, as it did, uh, as they did 20, 30 uh, years ago. Well, this lecture series began when a group of Bill's relatives, colleagues, and friends uh, established the lecture thinking that it would be very important to kind of capture the spirit of Bill McWilliams in terms of critical reflection. We never expected the series to go on as long as it has. We thought maybe five years would be good, then we thought ten years would be good, and here we are at the 20th uh, lecture, uh, which I think shows that there is still great hunger for rigorous debate, cre creative ideas, and critical reflection in practice and on practice. So this afternoon, we're promised critical reflection, first from Fergus McNeil, and then from a panel of service users and service practitioners, and then dialogue amongst the panel members, and then a chance for anyone who would like to comment or ask questions. Uh, that will Overall, will take us up to about four o'clock, just before four o'clock, perhaps, when there will be tea available. So let me first of all introduce Fergus McNeil, and then my colleague Jane Dominey, a member of the academic staff at the Institute of Criminology and another member of the steering group, will introduce the other uh, panel members. So Fergus... McNeil um, is Professor of Criminology and Social Work at the University of Glasgow. And prior to becoming an academic in 1998, Fergus worked for a number of years as in, in residential drug rehabilitation and as a criminal justice social worker. And I think that very practical experience is going to be pertinent to this afternoon's conversations. Now, uh, Fergus... Um, does extensive research on a wide range of uh, topics and also teaches both undergraduates and postgraduates. His main research interests revolve around sentencing, community sanctions, ex-offender reintegration and youth, youth justice, and various research projects and research publications have explored cultures and practices of punishment, particularly in the community. So there are too many books for me to go through them all, uh, but I will pick out in particular Reducing Reoffending uh, Social Work and Community Justice in Scotland, published with Bill, Bill White, um, and then Youth Offending and Youth Justice, uh, published with Monica Barry. But more recently, there have been numerous publications on desistance, and including uh, a, a publication on community punishment European uh, perspectives, and a number of publications too on offender supervision. So that's the starting point for this afternoon's uh, discussion. So over to Jane to introduce the other panel members.
We have three other panel members from whom we'll be hearing this afternoon. And I think that one of the things that I'd like to acknowledge is that some of them have had more notice than others of their elevation to the panel and and to particularly thank the couple of them who've had an extraordinarily small amount of notice of the greatness that has been thrust upon them this afternoon. Um, But we're in the lovely position of having three panel members with a real breadth of experience of probation supervision between them. Um, We have Mark, someone who has fairly recently been a probation service user, now involved in projects looking at service user involvement in probation. We have OA, a current probation officer, involved in fact in the same service user project as Mark. And we have Kim, who brings her extensive experience as a practitioner and a manager in the probation service. OE is currently working with the National Probation Service. Kim is a director of InterServe Justice, um, and the organisation that has responsibility for five of our new community rehabilitation companies. So each of those panellists will talk a little bit more to you over the course of the afternoon about their particular experience, their particular lives, but it's lovely that we have all three of them with us today. The next person to hear from is indeed Fergus, so thank you. Thank you uh, both, and thank you, Lorraine, for the introduction. Those of you that know me will know that uh, I very rarely speak from a text, but uh, carefully planning this event, I wanted to be sure not to talk for too long, so I have a text prepared, which I will try not to depart from. Apologies if that makes it a little bit less uh, fluent than I would hope. So I want to thank you all uh, for coming here. Uh, First and foremost, to remember and celebrate the legacy of Bill McWilliams. And I want to thank the organisers, and especially Brenda and John, for the invitation to play a part in this event. Um, I really do consider it a very great honour. I never had the opportunity to meet Bill, but I feel that somehow I've come to know him a little through Brenda and through his friends, especially Tony Bottoms and Mike Nellis. And of course, we can all have the pleasure of knowing Bill uh, through his writing. Those writings have been very important to me and many other probation scholars for several reasons. Perhaps most fundamentally, Bill's work is significant in terms of what it stands for. And for me, it exemplifies three key virtues that I think all uh, researchers and scholars in the broadest sense of the terms should seek to cultivate. Firstly, Bill was a genuine scholar. The depth and quality of his writing reflects, I'm sure, the depth of the intellectual curiosity that made him so well read. It also reflects, in turn, the care, precision and rigour with which he fashioned his thoughts and his ideas and his arguments. Secondly, Bill was a proper social scientist. In some of Bill's empirical research papers that I've read for the first time in preparation for today, I've been hugely impressed both by the sheer volume of the fieldwork involved and by the attention to detail that his meticulous analysis of data evidences. So, for example, in order to understand what serving prisoners understood about and wanted from the new aftercare services introduced in the late 1960s in England, Bill, uh, working alongside Martin Davis and Ian Earnshaw, interviewed no less than 407 prisoners in 14 prisons across the country, securing a 96% response rate from men imminently due for release from those prisons. That mammoth undertaking tells us something about Bell as a social scientist and about the value that he placed on comprehensive and careful listening. Thirdly, and just as importantly, Bell's love of and gift for scholarship was never detached from his commitment to public service. Bell applied both his considerable intellect and his energies and diligence to using research and scholarship to improve probation 
and therefore to improve society. For me, these three qualities, these three interwoven commitments to scholarship, rigorous social science and diligent public service are at their most compelling in Bill and Tony's remarkable 1979 paper on the non-treatment paradigm for probation practice. It's not the best title, it's a wonderful paper. If you haven't yet read it, you must read it. I read it first as a social work student in 1992. I can more or less remember the moment. I was coming to terms with my own journey at that point from the humanities, where I started in philosophy and history, to social science and then to social work practice in the criminal justice system. And here was the paper that mapped a path for me, uh, offering compelling arguments from normative principles alongside honest confrontation of empirical realities, at least as we then understood them. Just as importantly, rather than allowing the pessimism of that moment, the, the nothing works moment when faith in rehabilitation had more or less collapsed, rather than allowing that pessimism, that pessimism to dismantle the case for probation and for rehabilitation, Bill's and Tony's genius and creativity made an opportunity out of a threat. In fact, they literally made a moral virtue out of an empirical necessity. I won't restate the case here, but in some, they argued firstly, that even if there was then no evidence that treatment or rehabilitation worked to reduce crime, that was not a good reason to deny people help. Secondly, that if the idea of social diagnosis no longer made sense, then shared and respectful dialogue should shape the forms of help that were provided. And thirdly, that if it was wrong and unhelpful to construct clients as depending on professionals to fix them in some sense, then better to plan and offer help on a more collaborative basis. Furthermore, even if none of this help could be proven to reduce reoffending, that didn't mean there were not compelling moral moral and practical reasons for working in this way to support people. Any of you who have read my work or heard me talk will by now have cottoned on to my guilty secret. In very much of what I've written, I've simply followed this lead, sometimes updating these arguments with new evidence, particularly about desistance from crime, and sometimes trying to develop aspects of the ethical or normative arguments. Now, central to Bill and Tony's argument in that paper, and in both of their work, I think, more generally, lies a position or a stance that I've also tried to adopt and develop. One that centrally refuses to objectify people who have offended and been penalised. One that rejects policies and practices that construct people as damaged or diminished or deficient and in need of expert correctional intervention. Instead, in the last of that famous quartet of essays on probation history, published in 1987, Bill articulated what he termed the personalist approach to probation, invoking, but typically refining earlier philosophical thinking, and in this case, improving on no less a figure than Immanuel Kant, Bill insisted that people must be seen as ends in themselves, and never merely as the means to some other end, even if the ends in question were laudable ones, like reducing victimization or building a fairer society. With remarkable foresight, Bill identified the dangers both of managerialism and of the then fashionably radical Marxist school. Bill identified in both a willingness to treat people as objects to be manipulated for some other purpose, whether the preservation of the existing or social order or the creation of a new one. In that last of the four essays, reflecting on the collapse of confidence in rehabilitation, Bill quotes David Millard, who was himself reflecting on the work of Paul Halmus when he said, however much the counsellors explained their work in the language of technology, ultimately they placed their faith in the spontaneous power of love within a relationship. The technology was an attempt to give an extra dimension of respectability to what was basically a moral enterprise. In the paper, Bill continues to cite Miller, this time drawing on the work of R.D. Lang, 
to argue that we should not worry too much about what you've been calling professionalism. <laughs> trust the clients. Believe what they say about their experience and trust the immediacy of your own responses. In other words, be human. Clients, then, are neither to be managed on behalf of the state nor mobilized to overthrow it. Rather, they are to be heard and respected and, yes, loved. Though I suspect the language of love here is not intended to invoke soft or sentimental fellow feeling, but rather the page that I'm missing. <laughs> but rather the hard work of seeking and finding solidarity with one another and subsidiarity for one another in support of our mutual betterment and our reciprocal and collective interests. Against the backdrop of this brief resume of some of Bill's work, I hope you'll see why it seems fitting that today's memorial lecture is not a lecture at all. It seeks to embody Bill's personalist values by enabling a dialogue between people with different forms of expertise related to probation supervision. But before we move into that dialogue, I want to offer just a few final observations in an effort to bridge the gap between Bill's work and the present day. Firstly, it's worth noting that it's taken probation research much of the last 20 years to catch up with aspects of Bill's thinking. In spite of the long history of social work and probation claiming respect for persons as a core value, it's really only in the last decade or so that sustained and proper attention has begun to be paid to studying the lived experience of supervision, both for those whose responsibility it is to supervise, and arguably even more crucially, for those who are subject to supervision. We've borrowed the title of this event, Helping, Holding, Hurting, from a public lecture that I gave in Scotland in 2009, that lecture presented findings from an oral history of Scottish probation in the 1960s, a study itself inspired in large part by Bill's writing, but also driven by my own curiosity to see whether first-hand retrospective accounts of probation then complemented or contradicted the version of history that emerges from analysing documents. More recently, I've worked with colleagues in 23 European countries to develop and pilot new methods for studying probation, both as a lived experience and as a constructed practice. The photographs that are rotating in this presentation and in the reception areas are drawn from one of these pilot studies. They depict how some English, German and Scottish supervisees chose to visually represent what it feels like to be supervised. Secondly, and relatedly, this shift towards studying how supervision is experienced has been mirrored and far exceeded, in fact, by what is sometimes termed the narrative turn in criminology and social science more generally. The central importance of the analysis of people's narratives, their stories about themselves, will perhaps be best known to this audience in the work of desistance scholars like Shad, Maruna, Beth Weaver, and many others, whose careful attention to how and why people's stories change as they move away from offending, has done so much to inform and influence probation practice and criminal justice reform more generally. More recently still, Sarah Anderson's award-winning probation journal article on the value of bearing witness to desistance centres on the importance of being present and being with another as an enactment of a moral responsibility to support a transition, a transition from object to subject, and to recognise and endorse the humanity of those who have committed crimes. The echoes of Bill's work and its refinement in Sarah's argument are obvious, and they make me think how wonderful it would have been to have heard Bill's analysis of and engagement with desistance research, though I suspect his influence is already inherent in Tony Bottom's work on desistance and certainly on my own. Finally, I wonder what Bill would have made of how these two bodies of work focused on how people experience supervision and how they experience desistance help us make sense of broader currents of social change. Just as I sometimes like to conjure up an image of Bill and Tony struggling in a study somewhere to confront and find a way through the nothing works era, 
In my imagination, I can see Bill today angry and frustrated with the way in which probation's honourable but imperfect traditions came to be traduced and diminished by misplaced faith in managerialism, by the preoccupation with risk, and more recently by the ideologically driven, hasty and evidence-light pursuit of privatisation. I suspect Bill would have been a trenchant and compelling critic of the commodification and commercialisation of probation and of turning people into units to be efficiently processed in pursuit of profit. We may not have Bill with us now to face down the challenges of the harsh and amoral times in which we live, times in which the corruption by the market of the liberalism that his work expressed seems all but complete. But we do have the example he set, and we have the intellectual and moral <laughs> resources that his work continues to provide. So in what remains of our time this afternoon, we're going to hear firsthand about how our panellists experience supervision as a practice which they have constructed, or as a practice that they have been on the receiving end of. Whether that practice is construed as helping or holding or hurting, we're going to try together to figure out how to make it better and how to make society better at the same time. That seems an appropriate um, response to Bill's legacy. So, I shall invite, first of all, uh, get my order correct here, I'll invite Mark first to come up. And what's going to happen is that the three panellists are now going to share for five or ten minutes, simply from their personal experience, what they have, uh, what, what they've experienced in supervision for better or worse, uh, whether as a, a personal experience or, or a personal and professional um, experience. And once the three panellists have spoken in turn, the four of us will con constitute a panel which will engage in a dialogue amongst ourselves for your edification, briefly. <laughs> and then I'll hand over to Heather, who's going to take charge of the Q&A part of the afternoon. So first we'll hear from Mark. Thanks, Mark. Hopefully, I will hit on a couple of the points that have been mentioned previously. So, as a, you know, being supervised by probation, I mean, certainly from my experience, you know, it wasn't something I anticipated ever happening to me in my entire life. So, as you could imagine, you know, there was a fair amount of trepidation, fear, um, and equally, having heard a significant number of, well, disinformation, misinformation, myths um, as to what it was going to be like, um, you know, you are understand understandably apprehensive. However, from my experience, the myths were the myths. But nonetheless, there are some harsh realities of supervision that hopefully through the course of this discussion will be addressed and perhaps a way forward will be identified because there are things that it could be doing better. That's not to say that it's not working, but society as a whole is quite happy to ignore the system because they don't want to know, and as long as it doesn't impact in their lives, they're good. But nonetheless, it's a very real thing for so many people to have to live through and everything else like that. How to describe supervision? If I were in the Victorian age and I wanted to date someone, I would require a chaperone. And quite frankly, it's not too dissimilar. You need to be thinking constantly with this little shadow on your back. Depending on what restrictions you have, what context, what sentence, everything else like that, that will determine the nature of your supervision as to how much interaction probation will have with you. But it is like having a little shadow and a little voice in your head constantly sort of saying, should you be there, should you be doing this, or more to the point, just keeping yourself above water. In terms of the actual interviews themselves, quite frankly, I would love it if they put it in a completely different building, because I never want to go into that building again in my entire life. It scares the life out of me, which puts me on the defensive before I've even started. And strangely enough, I now actually spend more time in that building, because I'm part of a service user project, than I ever did when I was on the supervision. But nonetheless, 
it scares me. In that particular interview, the standard lines, how are you doing, how things are going. But in terms of good practice, a lot of perhaps subtle questions concerning uh, management of your offence, everything else like that, and getting you to understand the implications of what you've done. If you are willing to engage with your supervisor, and that again is crucial, your relationship with your OM, if you are willing to engage, it will work. If you aren't, or you're skeptical of the whole process, forget it. And there will be conflict and there will be an issue. And invariably the offender will blame probation. Unless you are willing to engage, it's not probation's fault. Probation will only have an issue with you if you give them reason to have that issue. So it was very personal and I think that's what you were hinting at earlier. Thankfully, the individuals that were involved in my supervision were human. Because up until that point, I'm afraid the system is faceless, but it's extremely aggressive and horrible. And then you're on the other side of it. And probation has a role in re-establishing you as an individual within society. That's not to say it's going to fix your problems. It isn't. But it's there to facilitate and help you understand how you are going to fit back into that process. Now, without the humanity of it, this is not going to happen. And I think I can successfully say that the three individuals that were through my process, all of them, in terms of good practice, were human beings above all. Yes, they had a responsibility, but the key responsibility in the whole process was mine. Not them. Fine, you know, if they felt need to question something, they would but it's ultimately me that takes responsibility to that. And I think they ref, you know, reflected and recognised that I was going to be that kind of individual that would. Make a mistake, put your hand up, you pay for it. Understandable. It's about then recovering. And probation is very much a part of that. Can they actually fix things? They can facilitate towards it, but as I've said, it's not their responsibility to do that. In terms of how we move forward, probation has a key role in reducing the reoffending rates. And it's certainly on the shorter sentences, we are not succeeding within that year. It is not working. Now, that may be a question of the individuals not willing to engage, or uh, different practices, or cuts, or res there, there are a number of key sort of things. But I think taking the political nature out of this now needs to be forefront and restoring the humanity and the social context that probation originally had, that's what it was there for, is key. I was very fortunate with the individuals that I had, but I'm also an individual that will take responsibility when required. So thank you for listening to me, but I, on the whole, had a positive experience. Um, so hopefully that will form the basis of a good discussion later. Thank you, Mark. So now we're moving to a, a frontline practitioner perspective, which is going to come from Oi, who very kindly has stepped in at relatively short notice. I think he had at least 15 minutes uh, to prepare a few thoughts. Um, so, on you come, Oi. Okay, yes, um, I was uh, kind of dropped in it a bit at the, uh, at the last minute. I wasn't really expecting to be uh, standing here talking to you today. I was expected to be in the audience. Um, and uh, I was actually caught in a thunderstorm as well earlier on. So I hope you'll forgive me if I appear uh, somewhat dishevelled and uh, also end up gibbering inanely, which hopefully I won't. Uh, but I have, uh, whilst I've been listening to uh, what people have, uh, have been saying, I have managed to uh, put together a, a few thoughts. Uh, I'm a probation officer, uh, I've been a probation officer for almost 10 years. I'm currently uh, running a Cambridgeshire uh, user involvement project across uh, Cambridgeshire, um, which Mark is, is, a, is a part of and a very um, valuable part of. Uh, and this is uh, using peer researchers um, who are service users um, or recently have been service users uh, and in uh, the capacity of 
interviewers and they're interviewing other service users and we're gaining some very valuable data from that. Uh, this is an ongoing project that we, that we hope will um, move on to further phases. Indeed, we hope that the um, Cambridge Institute of Criminology will be involved in, in future phases of that programme. But um, in thinking about that and in thinking about what people have been saying, uh, from a practitioner perspective, uh, I was reflecting on the fact that um, through my experiences of being a practitioner and through my experiences of um, starting and, and and helping to run this, this user involvement project. I was reflecting on the fact that um, there has been quite some resistance uh, from some practitioners in uh, embracing some of the innovative approaches uh, such as service user involvement. And I was reflecting on what, why this might be through my experiences. And um, as a practitioner myself, I was realizing that this is based partly on the pressures of practice, uh, increasing caseloads, uh, increasing levels of risk to manage, um, increasing pressures on us as practitioners, and also the constant changes in the service uh, from the split between CRC and MPS and uh, onwards through the, uh, the, through the oncoming changes of which I know there will be many. Um, and I think that these organisational processes, um, which often appear politically motivated and based on upon achieving favourable statistics rather than uh, reflecting real positive change is a definite frustration for the frontline practitioner. Uh, and I think this can feed into some of the frustration and some of the cynicism around innovative approaches. But um, wishing to achieve this, this, this real positive change and, and also wanting to change some of these processes is, is definitely what motivated me personally to become closely involved in, in the user involvement project. Um, but on the other side, nevertheless, I think with the changes in the service, we're also present, presented with a tremendous opportunity, I believe, to shape the uh, future of the service. And this would be for the practitioner as well as for the service user. I think that links quite closely with uh, today's remit to more fully understand the experiences uh, of those we, as practitioners, supervise and learn from this experience. We need to shape our own service to fit more closely, I believe, with the service user's experience. I hope today, in some ways, helps to further sow further seeds towards this end. Um, I think Mark spoke uh, quite eloquently earlier on about, about the positive change and wishing, wishing to achieve this positive change. Um, and so I think all I can really say is that um, from a practitioner perspective, I think that uh, days like today are, are very valuable in, in um, helping to take this forward. And I, I hope this links in closely with what I'm trying to, to uh, contribute towards achieving within um, uh, Cambridge RMPS today. I think that's pretty much all I can add for now. <laughs>
but I would also be driving a minibus with 12 of them in the back, uh, taking them swimming, ice skating, shopping, whatever we needed to do. Health and safety would be aghast at that kind of behaviour now. Um, I then qualified as a probation officer, so I got a caseload then. That was very serious and very responsible. But I did find uh, that I spent quite a lot of my time with a small patch um, and a very known group of, of people on my caseload. And when they didn't turn up, I'd bob down to the pub and go, oi. And then we moved from that, and we moved to something really quite different. Our buildings, our little buildings in neighbourhoods, became great big centres on industrial estates. And we didn't move from them. And they came to us because they were naughty, and we needed to make them move. And we were professionals, and we didn't. And we started to create a very different culture, and we started to actually create a very different probation worker, I think. And I think we're sort of moving through that now. And I'm really, really glad that we are. And I think those of us that have got any kinds of positions of responsibility or influence need to be trying to design and pushing our, our organisations and our services to something that is about being human and being brave enough to have meaningful relationships with our service users in pursuit of rehabilitation for all of our communities. But kind of what does it mean? I mean, was that more human, what we were doing then, than what we're, we're doing now? And what does being really human look like and what are some of the challenges around that? Well, the first thing I think that you have to do is that you have to start to break down some of those barriers between staff and service users. You have to try to get them closer together. And that's not an easy ask sometimes. You've got staff that are very scared of that, not all of them by any means. Some of them absolutely relish it and know exactly how to do it. But others are a bit scared of it. And service users, some of them are really quite suspicious of it. So particularly those that have been around for, for some time and think, what's, what's, what's going on there? Um, what's all this getting alongside me all about? Um, I just want to come in and you tick your box and I can go. So it's, you know, it's, it's about trying to find something that is different and breathe some fresh life into it, but it is also meaningful. And some of the ways that we do that, do that I think, um, and some of the things that signal change, um, it's been mentioned about service user councils, uh, and I think that done properly, these are, these are a, a really good way forward. This is about recognising that actually as organisations and as professionals, you don't have all of the answers, and it is not just your right and responsibility to design and deliver all of your services to people who have no say in it. So I think that we are moving in that direction to actually acknowledge the contribution that our service users can and should be making to the services that we develop and the services that we design and deliver. And we're moving in that direction. That has to be done in a proper spirit, though, because you can do all of those things tokenistically. You can do that. So there is something about what you bring to it that, it, that, that is about recognising that it has to be something meaningful. And you have to take some risks. You have to let go of some power and control. And I don't think that that's always easy and in all situations. We have to design models, I think, that are about recognising the strengths that service users have and bring. And I don't think we've always been particularly good at that. Lots of the stuff that we deliver is very needs-based. It's deficits-based. It is about objectifying. It is about talking about offenders in terms of the, you know, the bad things that they do and not the good things that they have and can contribute. So it is, it is reducing and objectifying. And I think we have to move to something that is very different. We have to design operating models. We have to design ass assessment systems that actually do recognise strengths and talents and work with those. And again, that's different. And it does raise lots of tensions about how do you get alongside somebody? How do you celebrate their strengths and talents? And how do you manage their risk? And can, are these things in conflict or can these things live happily together? And I think that's a, you know, a, a really interesting sort of question, the likes of which that can be kind of pursued and discussed in, in, in events like this. Um, there is also something about bringing the academic community and the practitioner community closer together, which I think is to the benefit of both. Um, we are very interested uh, in the CRCs and I think in probation in general in operationalising desistance. What does it actually look like when it's delivered? Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you know you're delivering it properly? And how do you know when you're really achieving something when what you're you know, waiting for is a two-year 
uh, reconviction rate down the line? How do we really measure the contributions that, that we're making and the strides that service users are, are achieving? So I will stop uh, my inane ramblings, but I would like to, I think, take the opportunity to fly a bit of a flag for probation people across both the CRCs and the NPS who have you know, been through really quite a difficult time. But actually, underneath all the gumph and underneath all of the politics and under, underneath all of the, you know, the negativity, there are still people on the ground who are working really, really hard, trying to be human, trying to make a difference, trying to turn lives around, trying to get alongside service users. It's not universal, and that's the point that we have to get to. But it absolutely is there, and I think that's what we really have to capitalise on, both in terms of our, you know, our organisational responsibilities, our designs of services, our valuing both, of our, both our staff and our service users as a real model to go forward with. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, as Heather said, I'm Rob Canton. I, too, am a member of the uh, steering group, and I have the, uh, the honour of being able to say out loud some of the things that are going to be going through my head over and over again on the train home. I'm not going to try to summarise. That would be presumptuous and well beyond me in any event, but here are some of the things that are going through my mind. And I'd like to begin, as I think is appropriate, with the thought, again, of uh, the work of Bill McWilliams, Often Bill began his studies with an historical approach. And one of the things that he memorably did was to try to identify different phases in the time in which probation has undertaken its work. And the framework that he suggested to us, others have taken up as well and used to tell the history of probation. But other scholars, less careful than Bill, I think, have sometimes recounted this as a, a probation's history in terms of legislation, in terms of policies... But if you think about it, policies are aspirations. They're what people hope will happen. But the lived experience and what actually did take place has been much less comprehensively explored. And that approach to history risks suppressing other experiences, including the voices of staff and service users. Bill certainly gave voice to practitioners, but there has historically been neglect and neglect of the user experience. And desistant scholarship has begun to change this. It's begun to restore meaning and agency and purpose to people's lives. It's made people, uh, it's encouraged us to think of people as ends in themselves, an expression which uh, I think uh, Immanuel Kant anticipated uh, Fergus McNeil in using that expression. <laughs> it, Criminology is often searched for the causes of crime, but that is a very bad start, isn't it? I mean, that immediately risks objectifying people. And it's the difference, as Fergus and others have spoken about this afternoon, between objects and subjects. If you reduce people to carriers of risks and need factors, that is a form of objectification, and it's likely to induce cynicism, disengagement, anger and dismay, despair, and the commodification that a recent speaker mentioned, and the moments that uh, some other service user less politely referred to. Phases too can exaggerate turning points, but there's a great deal of continuity, I think, in probation's history. And one of the strongest continuities is this idea of relationship. The very first probation staff, the police court missionaries, relied not only on their local contacts to put resources at probationers' disposal, but on the force of their own formidable personalities to develop a relationship that they saw as a precondition of supporting change by advising, assisting and befriending. Two people meet together. One is wanting to change but often isn't sure that they can, Com com often loses heart, can't see possibilities, begins to res uh, revert to ways of life with which they're more familiar. The other is wanting to support and encourage change and to bear witness to desistance. If the service user is in charge of that process, then as Kim has said, the best beginning is an appreciation of their strengths and their ambitions. Involvement now of service users can evoke the suspicions that Kim spoke about. And I think if I were a service user, I might well be saying, well, why this? Why me? Why now? What difference is it going to make anyway? 
But I think Mark said something profoundly important when he said, if you are willing to engage, if you're willing to trust, it will work and otherwise it won't. And that's advice to staff as well as to service users. Staff and service users must give of themselves and without the risk, the relationship will always be incomplete. For staff, this involves giving up some power, but the power that you give up is possibly a power that would otherwise turn into a form of oppression. So those are some of the things that will be around in my head when I go home this evening. But I now turn to the, uh, the pleasant uh, uh, task, uh, uh, which I'm delighted to have assigned to me, of thanking a number of people. Before I do that, those of you who've attended this event regularly will know that what I'm now doing has always been done much better than I do it by Professor Mike Nellis. And Mike is indisposed. He's not well at the moment and he can't be here. So perhaps you would like to associate yourselves with the good wishes that we would all like to send to Mike on his speedy recovery. I want to thank, first of all, the speakers. And all of them in their different ways, I think, have been absolutely extraordinary. So without Fergus, Fergus has steered the show. He's given us of his wisdom and his experience. He's managed to orchestrate the entire performance. Mark spoke with great eloquence and courage and passion. It's not at all easy to do what Mark did this afternoon. And then Owie and Kim were absolutely put on the spot. They didn't know, as they have already said, they didn't know when they set out this morning that they were going to be asked to do any such thing. And uh, Owie, at least, like me, arrived here in Cambridge being absolutely saturated, which is never good for the confidence. And I think that your contribution in making this event... Uh, a much better event than it could possibly have been without you is something that we should all warmly appreciate. So, Jane, can I ask you, please, to come and pass a token of thanks to uh, all our speakers, while perhaps I can invite the audience to express appreciation in the usual way. There are other splendid people that I now need to go on to thank besides. And the next people to thank are the staff of the Institute and also the law department that we're in at the moment. A lot of people put in a lot of work behind the scenes here. But there's one person who I will embarrass and make to blush by mentioning especially, and this is Joanne Garner. Many of you will have had contact with Joanne in uh, getting in touch with her to say that you're attending. I didn't know today, until today, that uh, this is the last time that Joanne will be involved in this way. The McWilliam Steering Group was appalled to hear that Joanne <laughs> is leaving, and I think that the staff of the Institute will be similarly in a state of shock. Over many years, Joanne's efficiency, good humour, hard work has been an enormous factor in making the McWilliams Lecture Series uh, the success that it has been and continues to be. So this time, Brenda, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to do the honours and to pass on a, a, a token of our esteem and thanks and good wishes to Joanne Garner. final remarks. Um, some of you are going to be attending the meal that's taking place in an Indian restaurant in Cambridge later this evening and the advice is please make your own way there. I think that everybody knows how, uh, how to get there and if they don't uh, Brenda and others will be happy to uh, uh, advise you. I need to thank uh, Dan and Steve who are responsible for the audio and the recording that's taken place. Um, we, have, we wanted to capture the occasion, and, and there is a, 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 re, a recording has been taking place, but there will need to be some discussion about how and whether, indeed, that's going to be disseminated. But that we're, we're on the case with that, and we would like to, to share uh, the experience of the afternoon. I'd like to thank also the caterers for providing us with an excellent lunch, and maybe, if we're lucky, an excellent tea. And then, finally, um, just to say this is the 20th lecture in this series, which is a wonderful achievement. 
when the series started, I don't think anybody had the ambition. I wasn't a member of the group then, but I don't think anyone thought that it would continue for quite as long as it has and been quite as successful as it has. Brenda has set out some uh, reprints of past lectures and their various memorabilia outside where we, where we had our lunch. Um, it's the intention of the steering committee to continue this series for as long as it continues uh, to, to, to be successful and to be well received. But for long-term sustainability, we do need to think about funding, as you'll appreciate. And we are trying to be creative in doing this. But among the ways in which this could be done is, uh, is a collection of money. And as in past years, you will, on the way out, find a couple of people with uh, huge empty buckets, uh, which you are encouraged to, to fill. Uh, if you haven't anything with you but want to uh, send a donation later, then anyone on the committee will advise you how to do that. So thanks again to the speakers above all, uh, the organisers too, and to all of you for coming and for your participation in and contribution to an extremely interesting debate. Thank you. Thank you.